Hello and welcome again to our IBC EMINA webinar. Uh, we had a little pause um, and some of you also attended Eurocom, uh, which I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and today uh, we have a new guest, a new speaker. Um, hi, Lindsay. Hi there. Uh, so Lindsay Alton Bogart is the founder and principal consultant of the Mirror, Mirror Team Alignment Process. And uh, she will be talking about how to align the teams, how to improve the business results. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, some of the new research that uh, Lindsay is going to present. Um, so uh, we will be taking the questions uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, Lindsay, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, hello and welcome everyone to this webinar on align your teams and improve business results. I'm going to be using the term social alignment because that's what's in the literature. I'll tell you all about it. Um, but it's an exciting field. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and I hope you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, actually interspersed um, in this presentation are excerpts from the latest research or research from the past 20 years actually. And I'm going to read out those excerpts and just sort of let them sit with you to sort of build up a picture of what knowledge exists in the field. Um, I'll also be preparing, um, presenting, sorry, case studies. Um, so if you want copies of the materials or anything else, my email address is at the top of the chat field and it'll also be on the last slide. Um, I want to start by getting us into... Um, into the frame of mind for all of this and just look at a bit of a sort of illustrative sequence if you like. Um, here we have uh, something on how people see things differently. So imagine yourself, you know, you've got your perspective, you've got facts that you know and in amongst all of that are blind spots and errors. You've got interpretations that you make, you've got assumptions and logic that you use. And then you've got things that you know you don't know. So all of this um, makes up, say, your radar on the world or your perspective. Perhaps if you're particularly knowledgeable, uh, that might look like this. But anyway, for, the, for argument's sake, let's just say if you put the whole lot together, it looks like this. And then supposing we're on a team and I've got my radar on the world and then we're working with somebody, say him and her, and they've got their radars. Now, these could be pointed in all sorts of different directions. Of course, it doesn't really matter. But for this purpose and this illustration, they've got their whole reality. But it's only where they overlap that they have a shared current reality. And this presentation is going to look at the shared current reality and the implications of that on business. So here's the first excerpt from research. It's, um, it's by Galotti. It's just from last year, so it's fresh out. And... Um, him and his team, they say that it's recently been found that when people reciprocally exchange information about each other's thinking and the meanings that they are ascribing to things, processes of alignment tend to unfold over time, creating a social interaction and a shared understanding, which is the base foundations of social alignment. So I find this um, really quite interesting. It's, it's, it's a lovely area and I've got um, a a sort of agenda here to go through. Um, I want to start with a story about how I stumbled onto, onto social alignment and then I want to go into the link to performance and how it affects business performance before unpacking social alignment into its components and the conditions for social alignment and how they can change. Then I'll discuss Mirror Mirror. So that's the social alignment acceleration process that I'm working on now that's all about this and uh, give you some results from some case studies and then look at, in general, what can be done to improve social alignment. So the story, let's go to the 90s. Um, it's in the UK, I've just graduated, and I start working for um, some small organizations. And when I say small, I mean organizations of less than 10 people entirely. So I'm either leading these or I'm growing these organizations in an organization that size, you can really get tight on who is doing what, who is who, what we want to achieve, and how we're going to get there. It's very fresh indeed. And um, then by a twist of fate, some years later, I was offered a position to work as a communication consultant in a global energy um, industry uh, in a company in the Netherlands. And as you can imagine, I'm totally psyched. So there's this, um, I, I, you know, it's going into the big league. Um, I get to hear and see what's behind these big brands and get to find out how they're so well organized to be making so much money. 
And then when I get there, it's, it's fascinating. There's some amazing people, incredible projects, and there's all this order. There is governance, job descriptions, strategy processes. But at the same time, underneath all that, I can't get the kind of clarity and the really tight working environment that I used to get in small organizations. And it's just really confusing. And I'm kind of thinking it's a bit like the fog it's a bit like a fog that's made up of all of these things. It's misunderstandings, it's assumptions, it's biases, all sorts of biases, um, information gaps, influences, just the way that people think differently. Um, and it seems to get in the way of performance. That, you know, it, it means that people aren't all going in the same direction and operating in the same way. And uh, I'll give you an example about what this looks like. So let's take one. Okay, we need to improve quality. Why isn't this item a higher priority? Well, if this isn't addressed, this person will make decisions and they will take actions based on their understanding that quality should be a higher priority. If this isn't addressed, this person will not get to find out why something else is a higher priority and the people that she's interacting with won't get to find out why quality could be a higher priority. But either way, let's say, that's a disconnect, a kind of misalignment. Let me go to another one. Um, he isn't taking the time to listen to my views, so he obviously doesn't think they're worth much. Now, this person, this is a bit more difficult to deal with, of course, because it's more about social and, in, and political um, situations. Um, now, this is an assumption. This, he could be right, he could be wrong. But either way, if this isn't going to be addressed, then this particular disconnect will lead to a breakdown in their working relationship, which is not going to help business performance. So it's all quite kind of obvious. Um, but as a communications person, I'm thinking, I really have a responsibility to do something about this because it's, it, it's so linked to the, to the impact on the business. So I take my query forward and I go and talk to somebody um, senior in the business who's very approachable. And he says, in a complex environment like this, there's a lot of ambiguity. And I think, yes, it is ambiguity. You know, tell me more. And he says, well, um, in, in this organization, we see that everybody's a leader. And one of our core business, core leadership competencies is the ability of people to tolerate ambiguity. So for the next couple of years, I go about thinking that this is my problem, tolerating ambiguity but something still doesn't sit right. And the reason for that is that there is unavoidable ambiguity, absolutely, it's, it's, it's everywhere. But there's also avoidable ambiguity, and that's the stuff that leads to poor decisions and actions, causes a load of frustration, and costs a load of money. And I say, in the future, it's only going to get worse because you've got dispersed teams, diverse teams, short-term teams, freelance stuff, people who are going to need to share a current reality about where they're going, but they probably won't even get the chance to talk, let alone meet. And then in the, um, in the future, you've got technology, automation, the need for accelerated learning and performance. If you want to accelerate learning and performance, you have to have people tightly aligned. And this is where I'd like to run a poll. I'd like to find out how much social misalignment do you see? Do you see a great deal or some misalignment or not much at all? So, the poll is going to be open. Yes, the poll is open. Okay, we have still some attendees voting. Right now we have 76%. Let's wait for another second if anybody's going to join. Okay, I will close the poll now and see the results. Lindsay, do you see the results? I don't see the results. Okay, the results are, yes, a great deal, 46%. And some looks familiar, 54%. And uh, nobody answers uh, answered not much, not at all. Okay. All right. So, seeing this social misalignment as I did, I thought, 
what's going on. It's a bit like dark matter. It's kind of all of these misalignments, especially in a big, large organization, it's almost like they're everywhere. They're, they're, they're important. Um, they are having an impact, but people don't sort of see it. They don't seem to understand it. So I'm asking some questions and I'm thinking, um, all right, what is happening here? And these are the responses I'm getting. This is impossible to manage. We're busy with other priorities. We don't have the capability. And to me, this sounds a little bit like excuses, because if we can figure out what our customers are thinking and feeling and leverage that to make more money, then surely we can be doing something about this with everything that we know about psychology today. Here's another excerpt. So this is back 18 years ago, Baron said, Working teams and organizations are faced with challenges of establishing common frames of references, reference, resolving discrepancies in understanding, negotiating issues of individual and collective action, and coming to a joint understanding. Interesting. And when we think of a joint understanding, typically we might think of the image on the left here where everybody's aligned with the leader. Um, I'd say that's yesterday's alignment, whereas today employees need to be aligned together as a team. So anyway, What's going on? Another reaction. The role of team leaders and managers is to get their teams aligned. Now, yes, I mean, to, to a certain extent, of course, it is. Um, and I want to come back to the role of team leaders and managers later. Um, but let's have a look at the word alignment, because I think there's even some fog around that itself. Because if you think about the definition of alignment, you think about strategic alignment, when employee goals connect with organizational goals. And so, yeah, here we are. It's all done on paper but there's still the fog. And this is where the term social alignment has come up in the social sciences as being when people have a shared current reality. Now, that's fascinating um, for me. Um, and let's look at what that really means. So there's three components. Let's look at the diagram on the right hand side. If everybody has a relevance to being in the team, and the reason why we talk about a team, con team environment is because they need to have a shared context in order to be aligned, which means they need to have a shared goal. If everybody has a purpose or a reason to be in the team, that's part one. That's, that's their vested interest. The part two is shared cognition. That's a bit about what we talk about all the time in terms of people being on the same page. Do they have a good understanding, a shared understanding of their context? And then the social participation piece is, can they all activate that understanding in order to go ahead and change something and achieve their goals? So this, this piece is that um, it's not about people agreeing with each other. It's about people appreciating others' views and finding the compatibilities within their shared context and being able to take um, effective action to go ahead. So um, here's another quote, and this is from Van den Bosch in 2010, who says that shared cognition, that piece of the triangle, is a critical driver of team performance, especially in shared mental models, team situation awareness, and understanding communication as a fundamental component of how information is processed at the team level. Okay, let me now just move on to um, a bit about performance. And I've sort of summarized it all in a slide here. Um, and it looks like this. So on the enablers at the top right, we have storytelling well known as um, a good way to get people aligned in terms of what, what's happening and what needs to be done. Um, engaging leadership, culture and behaviors, we all know that they're enablers um, to, um, to, to getting people um, together and on the same page and moving in the same direction. But we also have this piece I'm about to go into called um, Mirror Mirror, which is about perception comparison. Now, if you do something like Mirror Mirror, you'll, you'll help people reach a level of social alignment that is better than they had before. But if you also put those other enablers together, they'll move to a, to a more sustainable piece about shared mental models, having a way of thinking about the world and activating their and working together so that they can achieve their goals. The results, of course, are improved decisions and actions. And that's either immediately or on a more ongoing basis. So it's the, it's the improved decisions and actions that's the interesting piece. And it, this, if, if you look at that bit, this is not about then 
um, the soft stuff in terms of having people be heard so that they can feel better and so that they can give higher engagement scores um, and, and produce a bit more discretionary effort. And, and I think organizations are still looking at things in, in that way um, where you know just having people feel better means that your, your rates are going to be a bit better for, for a attraction and retention engagement. If you look at the implication of social alignment and the decisions and actions that are taken to Im that are improved, it's much more of a strategic driver then because uh, you're impacting performance and innovation, which leads to more sustainability and reputation for the company. So I think social alignment is a very powerful piece. Here's another quote, and this time it's from 2016. When teams are on the same page and interpret incoming information and activities in a similar or compatible manner, Research suggests that the team will engage in more effective and efficient team behaviours, thereby impacting team performance. So again, I'm just going to let that sit with you. And now I'm going to go deeper into social alignment and look at those components again and some conditions for it. But let's just take a step back for a second, OK? Let's look at where we are today. Arguably, the world is getting more complex. And when you have a more complex situation for a team, it means there are actually more things to make sense of and more need to align. Um, engagement scores are notoriously um, still difficult, um, a difficult piece. Um, some, in some places, engagement scores for, for employees are going down. And then people are bringing in enterprise social networks, Yammer, SharePoint, that help people to share information but they're not really designed to improve clarity and alignment between people because you don't get down to the why. You don't dig deeper than um, things that they're already able to access in terms of the way that they're thinking. So let's go back to that def definition of social alignment that you could say, paraphrase now here, that it helps people in organizations get the shared and actionable clarity needed to achieve their goals. Great. The anchors and barriers. The barriers we've looked at, gaps in understanding, assumptions, unconscious biases, etc. All of those things are, are naturally how humans operate and naturally how they work. There are causes to those barriers. I'll come on to those. Those are um, that, that's another topic. But the anchors that we're looking pe to pe to get people to, you know, they're age old. I mean, why are we here? What are we doing? Where are we going? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So having people aligned means that they've got their own unique perspective on looking at that in a way that's complementary to their team members so that they can move forward. So the conditions are the causes um, often of barriers, and I'll go through that right now. There are seven conditions to social alignment. Uh, firstly, as the biggest one, it's situation continuity. You know, if the best conditions are that there is no change going on whatsoever, the future is completely predictable. The next one is that clarity from the organization is um, perfect. There is a very clear and specific frame within which the team is operating. The team is available. The team leader themselves are available and open to enabling team members. Um, the communica communication culture is great. Behaviors in the team are open, respectful, inclusive. Um, the team is familiar with their context, so they know how the company works, they know the culture, the processes, uh, their mental models about how things operate is good, and they're a great fit for the goal. So I don't know who's worked in a team like this before, but if you were to work in a team like this, you could say that in terms of fog levels, where um, complete misalignment is at the top and full alignment is at the bottom, where you have good conditions for social alignment, you're going to get to a level of um, fog that's completely okay. You're never going to be able to get rid of all of the fog. That's fine. Let's now take the conditions down to medium. Okay, so fog level two is where, you know, the situation is changing. You don't have complete clarity. The team leader isn't so good at engagement, etc. Now, in that graph, you can see that even if even if the team were going to successfully work on alignment and keep working on it, it's a hard slog. Um, it takes months and months to be able to, to operate in an environment like that and, and really get on top of environment, so on top of, on top of alignment. And everything above that dotted line there is a cost, of course. There's a cost to that. It's a cost to not achieving your objectives or, and not moving forward as fast as you could have done. Um, and that cost uh, varies on the situation, of course. Now let's take um, these conditions down to a low, and I would say that a low situation, uh, a, a low low conditions comprise a team that is new, so they have their job descriptions and they all come into the team 
not knowing what they don't know, and so they feel quite a lot of clarity, but within a couple of months, um, they find that they don't have the engagement levels they need, they discover all sorts of problems that they are maybe not fit to handle, um, and there's all sorts of problems that kick in. Again, that peak there at the top, that could continue. I mean, I've been in teams where you just, the, the fog level just is there, it's just, it's just not going to go away, because nobody stops to take a step back, and everybody's chasing their tail, um, but if they did work at it, again, it would take months and months and months. And um, here's a really interesting piece um, of research from Box and Platts from 2005. And it says problems caused by misalignment include, let's see if you've, if you've um, experienced this, confusion, waste of time and money and opportunity, diminished productivity, demotivation of individuals and teams, internal conflicts, power struggles, and ultimately project failure. And I like this next bit the best because it says, as well as resulting in time and energy spent doubting, conspiring, guessing or gossiping when that same energy could be deployed in moving an organization forward. Now, this is interesting because it shows that the way people feel is relevant to business performance, because if you don't feel heard, if you don't feel um, inspired, if you don't feel cl the clarity that you need, if you if you don't feel motivated, then this is what's going to happen. Um, and we've got a quote about that. 2017, again, just from last year, emotions have a far greater impact and influence on the emotional reactions, thinking and behavior of teams and organizations than previously assumed. And these emotional, cognitive and behavioral reactions have a direct impact on group, team and organizational performance. So what people think and feel especially if you want them to take more ownership for their work, it's incredibly important, as we know already, but this is just a different angle on it. So let's say a big intervention like Mirror Mirror comes in. When I say it's big, it doesn't mean it's very time consuming and expensive, it's just going to make a big difference. It comes into this low conditions, um, worst case scenario, and it takes all of that cost and all of that frustration away. Now, when you do that, you're taking a, when you are able to run mirror mirror, and I'll explain about it in a minute, you're only really taking a snapshot and, and they're labeling teams to get clarity at that particular point in time. Of course, the situation is constantly changing. There's going to carry on being these poor conditions. So misalignment, the fog is going to go back up again, of course. But our research and our case studies show that it takes three, six, nine months for that to go back up. So all of that cost and that frustration and that um, inefficiency um, ineffectiveness is going away, um, which is why I'm obviously uh, quite uh, passionate about this topic. Um, so let's look at Mirror Mirror right now as a social alignment accelerator. And we, we talked about um, uh, this being based on a shared reality. So Mirror Mirror is a proprietary organization effectiveness process that, that accelerates that clarity and alignment. It's the quickest and most cost efficient way of preparing teams to achieve their goals by helping them build a better shared current reality, make better decisions and take better actions. And the first question we start with, of course, is, well, what is reality? Um, and the advertising agencies taught us right back from the 70s that is actually just how people perceive their situation. And so there is a three-step process to Mirror Mirror. It starts by capturing how people perceive their situation at work. So it's one-to-one -one interviews, 45 minutes long. Uh, it's a very psychological safe place to be because all answer, answers are anonymous, it's actually irrelevant who thinks what, what at this point in time. The questions that we ask are not personal, they're not judgmental, they're all about the team goal. Um, and they're also questions that aren't normally asked, so things like what's the biggest opportunity facing your team, I mean that's the kind of thing that people have to really sort of devise their answers on the spot, which is why it's important it's a guided interview. Um, and um, it helps people surface what they really think. Now we take that as data and we compare the data, the perceptions between the team members to show it visually actually where the alignment gaps and opportunities are. Um, and then we deliver uh, and we show those visualizations at the beginning of a session with everybody together to say, okay, here are the visualizations. This is where you stand. This is where the common areas are. And these are the areas of difference. And it's the subsequent conversations, of course, that make a big difference. And this is what some of the visualizations look like to show, you know, what percentage of the team feel this or think that, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, like I said, um, it's actually about the dialogue afterwards. It's actually about using that dialogue to have people inquire about why they think what they're thinking and feeling, to realize that everybody has a valid perspective, and then create a new meaning between people so that they're, they have a better understanding of where they're all going or where the conflicts are that need to be addressed. Um, and when facilitated, that doesn't need to be a scary thing. Now, I love this image because everybody here is looking at something and they've all got this valid perspective. And it's only until they realize they're dealing with an elephant and if their goal is to move that thing, um, say, one kilometer to the east, they'd have to talk to each other to figure out how to do it. Um, so teams that have the most fog typically are new teams, virtual teams, teams in tra transformational tr change or, or struggling teams, actually. And social alignment is great when you look at strategy engagement, change management. It's things are changing and people need to get their head around that. So let's do that together. So Mirror Mirror was run uh, with a number of companies and we've got three results for you here. We asked people straight after that Mirror Mirror workshop about uh, their levels of um, positivity, of clarity and alignment, and their perceived level of preparedness to go ahead and achieve their objectives. Um, the case studies here are Samsung, um, a project team at a university in Austria, and Aon, the global risk management organization who did a quick scan version of Mirror Mirror. Now, there are only actually, there's only actually one of these um, outputs that's really relevant because you could find a team, go into a dialogue and discover quite a lot of stuff they didn't expect to discover that creates more uh, work or creates more things to get over that leaves them feeling less positive and less aligned, but at least they knew about it and they're better off knowing, so they're better prepared then. So it's the, it's the right hand indicator the, the perceived level of preparedness to achieve their objectives that really counts. Now, the reason why these ratings are so high is because of two really easy things. On the left-hand side, when people become more conscious of their views, assumptions, and mental models, they've got more flexibility to adapt them. Number two, on the right-hand side, when people are able to share their thinking with others in an open and respectful environment, they can reach a better shared current reality. And so Mirror Mirror is exclusively designed to facilitate better uh, social alignment by broadening their current reality through perception, comparison and dialogue. If you know where the alignment gaps and opportunities are, you know where to have the conversation. And a lot of other conversation in business is, of course, extremely inefficient because you're dancing around sort of social or political um, and, and polite ways of ways of discussing things with each other without actually getting to the point. Now, there's four benefits that really come out of Mirror Mirror. I've talked about one of them, which is the improved decisions and actions that people make. But the others are that just by putting people in an environment where they are respecting each other's views and realizing that what people feel is, is real for them at that time, and when you have them not needing to agree, but just to understand each other, you are creating a better team culture. Uh, you're promoting team engagement by doing this, and you're generating really useful feedback for stakeholders who'd be interested to find out what does this team think about safety or other initiative. Now, three months after the workshop, we went back to the teams again, and we asked them how much they saw these benefits. So the benefits are along the bottom here. And we said, how many people still see these benefits in place three months after a four hour workshop? And uh, we're just using the Samsung team and the university team here because we don't go back after this quick scan version. And this is the result. The reason why these results are so good are again twofold. On the left hand side, people take more ownership when their views are included. It all seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? We're, we're not, it, this isn't rocket science. It's just putting things together in a way that works. And on the right-hand side, the extent to which learning is applicable relates to how closely it's linked to the current context. Mirror Mirror is an entirely facilitated process. We're not going in as consultants and saying, you've been employed to do your jobs and we think you need to do this to do it better. We're, we're, we're believing that they will know what to do to do it better, or will know what questions to ask in order to be able to do it better. And it's all anchored in their team context. So here's another quote from 1998. 
and it's about um, where people share their thinking together and how and the importance of a um, of psychological safety. So forming a sense of community where people feel they will be treated sympathetically by their fellows seems to be a necessary first step for collaborative learning. Without a feeling of community, people are on their own. They're likely to be anxious, defensive and unwilling to take the risks involved in learning. So broadening a shared current reality is actually learning. Let me now tell you about just checking the time. I'll have to give you a quick rundown of a couple of case studies. Um, of Mirror Mirror. I've got the three that we discussed. I'm only going to go through the university team and Samsung about just to give you a flavour of what it looked like. So here's the project team from the University of Applied Sciences in Upper Austria. Eight master's students uh, studying healthcare, social and public management. Um, they're a new team. They've got six months to run a project, um, equal kind of balanced gender diversity, varying levels of work experience. Now they were, their challenge was to translate a co-living housing concept from Vienna to Linz in five months. Uh, the concept is enabling students to share accommodation with elderly people. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a sort of wave of this going out, going around, particularly in Germany and Austria. Now, right early on in the project, um, I knew that they came across a couple of barriers and they discovered early on that in Linz, where they're based, it's difficult for older people to even find accommodation and there's an excess of student housing. So how can students go and live with older people? So there's this sort of potential showstopper to the project immediately. And Mirror Mirror was brought in because the professor, Professor Johann, yeah, um, Johanna Ansengruber, wanted to teach the team about teamwork, about communication um, and about strategy. So. We ran the questions, the interviews, and this is what we found at the outset. 80% were positive about the project. Everyone said the team's working well and it's aligned or well aligned and 70% average rating for morale. So given the fact that they know about this potential showstopper, um, we speculated that actually um, people do tend to go into a project with a very positive outlook because there's lots of things that they still know that they still don't know. Um, so they're just being optimistic and uh, they're also hearing what they want to hear because they're still piecing together an overview and don't have a really detailed piece at this moment. Um, and so that has affected the um, team purpose. And the first insight here was in response to the question, what's the purpose of your team? Simple question. So 38% um, um, that's to, to see if elderly people can co-live with younger people. Same number again, to develop a new concept for co-living in Linz. And then a quarter said to find out if the concept from Vienna works in Upper Austria. Now you can see that there are quite subtle yet important differences between the perception of what the team purpose is here. Um, and that was our first insight. Another insight was that once asked that, the next question was, what do you think your team should do next? 36% were not sure what they should do next and everybody else was completely mixed. And so you see here that when the purpose is not crystal clear and it can sort of morph and change and people's perception of it can morph and change, the disconnects become magnified when it comes down to execution. What shall we do? So the um, tack that we take in the process is to, to go into the dialogue groups, discuss the common ground and differences, expand the views, capture ideas and questions and we frame the workshop to agree actions and to agree a, um, an, a, an action agenda and deadlines for going forwards and what people said coming out of it um, along the bottom for participants one in the yellow says I realized it's important to address these things even though they might already seem clear and Mirror Mirror helps me reflect on a lot of tasks concerning the project from different points of view and um, Professor Johanna Anson Gruber said it worked because everyone who was engaged, it was their pressure in their context. She loves it. It's great. Um, so if they hadn't taken time out to discover the differences in purpose, it could have really had an impact on, the, on their um, effectiveness. Let me go quickly to um, the Samsung um, logistics team example, where we had 15 people in um, the electronics um, side of the corporation delivering logistics services in Europe various roles, broad diversity, um, and they had quite an unusual situation. 
um, the workload of the team was going to reduce by 50%. What was actually happening is that um, Samsung had sold the printer line of business to HP, and so uh, that whole part of the logistics work just wouldn't be there. So even though there was reassurances that there would be no redundancies, the team felt really flat. There was an innovation day planned to involve start, uh, staff in creating a new team role. Uh, but the HR manager knew that innovation doesn't happen when there's no team alignment or positivity. Um, and this is what she said. So she chose Mirror Mirror to engage the team in advance of this change. Uh, she said people are closing down rather than learning and developing, and the team leader himself, Tony, said if this team can grasp the fact that they can take some lead on some new projects, we're halfway there. We need their leadership, we need their drive, we need their inspiration. Um, you know, how can we get that? Um, so we went through the process, interviews, captured the responses, synthesized the findings, and scheduled the workshop. Here are some of the outset, outset um, findings. Everyone say, says the team works well together. Hey, here we go again. 90% agreed the team has the resources and skills it needs to deliver. So you could walk into that team, have a look at them all delivering, meeting their KPIs, and go, what's wrong with this team? But if you get under the surface and ask them about alignment, where 88% felt the team was not aligned or somewhat aligned, and 56% felt negative or somewhat negative about developments. So they've got this innovation day coming up. What's happening? I've got a few insights to share with you here. Um, but first, to explain that, um, as a logistics team, in order to just deliver at a basic level, get that part from there to there, uh, they just need to work to get well together. So if they weren't saying they worked well together, they would be colossally failing. Um, so that team working well together doesn't actually say much at all, other than the fact that they are uh, meeting their KPIs on the basic level. Insight number one. The manager was, was saying there would be no redundancies, but people repeatedly told us in interviews there will be redundancies. And in fact, one member of staff had already left anticipating the fact that she would be made redundant. So what's happening here is that because what the managers are saying, no matter how much credibility the managers have got, because what they're saying doesn't make sense, staff cannot compute and will make up their own reality that does make sense. So we were able to address that on the spot in the workshop um, by getting clarification there and setting it right. The second insight that we found that was there was a missing stretch goal. They are meeting their KPIs, they're just delivering um, everything that they're supposed to deliver, but it's all about running routines. You know, what's the point? Why are they there? What are they pushing? Where are they moving to? And they've been in limbo for so long um, that that's the situation. You could say that's down to the line manager, but the line manager's got a bigger organization to ask, answer to who's got another situation. So these things happen, of course, all the time. Um, and we were able to look at that and discuss the innovation day and present it then as an opportunity uh, rather than just another exercise. Uh, the third piece was came as a surprise to everybody is about knowledge silos in the team where the younger members of staff felt that knowledge and experience wasn't shared and that that was a risk. It's a dependency risk because what happens if somebody's away or on holiday? It's inefficient because every time they want something, they have to go and ask somebody to process something to give them the answer. Why don't they just learn to do it themselves? And then if they're not doing it themselves, it's a blocker to their professional development. And this was a really interesting piece in the dialogue um, sessions because the older members of staff had no idea that's what, what was being felt. And so instead of being a bunch of individuals with their processes running routines, they started to think of themselves as a developing team going somewhere. Um, the results were excellent, um, as I presented before, and, and people, uh, people commented, you know, great to get to know, know people better. Um, interesting to see these insights. I hope we can continue to be so honest with each other. Great to hear that management's open to our ideas. Um, you know, management can feel that, of course, they're open to ideas. They're just not coming up with anything. But do those people have permission or feel that they're in an environment where their ideas will make a difference? So that's what it really got to. Now let's finally look at improving social alignment in general. What can be done? And we'll come back to this line manager issue. Is social alignment a line manager responsibility? Well, of course, in part it is. But they've got their own perspectives. They've got their own pressures. And this is about organizational effectiveness. It's about people. Anybody to do with comms, HR, OE, change um, has a remit to help with this. So I don't think it's black and white about line managers. And they are also in a difficult position because they, um, they need to frame up 
the situation for their staff. What are the KPIs? What is our brief? What do we need to get done? That's a briefing role. Frankly, it's a bit of a tell, okay? But you can't tell people to align. That's a facilitation piece, um, and that's much more of a facilitation role. So we're asking line managers to be briefers, facilitators. We're not getting them any tools to do with it, and we're piling on loads of pressure. Um, no wonder it's a difficult place to be. No wonder engagement scores are slipping. Um, so here are a few interventions that I think line managers can work with um, support people on. Um, there's three interventions in the yellow boxes. One is about building and understand about the relevance of social alignment. Um, its importance actually. The other is about giving permission to take people up time to for people to take time out and have a conversation about what's going on and how they see things um, uh, and and how they could um, broaden the way that they see things in conjunction with others. And the next bit is about behaviours, those inclusive, open, and respectful behaviours that I'm talking about. And those interventions will have an impact. They will they will include the employee voice and build more ownership, more belonging more positivity and momentum if those um, if, if they can be taken on board and the results of course not only are improved decisions and actions and the other things that I spoke about it's it's avoiding wasted time avoiding wasted energy and wasted resources that annoys everybody so the behaviors piece let's unpack the open respectful and inclusive behaviors piece a little bit so that's about prioritizing the shared goal it's being willing to share being willing to listen, being willing to seek dialogue, and being curious about differences rather than threatened. Uh, it's being positive and constructive and taking ownership and engendering this sense of we're all in it together and everybody is valid. Um, I think one of the biggest um, things here is this. Disagreement is okay. And the reason for that is that if you have one person with one viewpoint and one with another, and you can find that compatibility bridge, that is innovation, of course. That's that's a new way of thinking. That's a new way forward. And companies are going to need to do that more and more in the future. Um, so the other piece, just unpacking dialogue, is that it doesn't take 10, 15 minutes just to refresh everybody's memories who's in a working environment on what is effective dialogue. You know, speaking for yourself, treating everyone as an equal, and putting this up before a conversation to set the scene for effective dialogue makes a huge difference. So overall, things that can be done are recognise the importance, being okay to stay, take a step back, using dialogue to clear the fog. And that's where line managers are role models, undoubtedly, for, especially for behaviours. Um, they're enablers because they will give permission to have this kind of activity going on, but support partners um, are, as guides and facilitators can go a long way here because there's especially somebody from the outside coming into a team environment and facilitating um, makes things um, a lot easier. So ultimately, I think people come to work to feel valued and understood. And when that happens, they move from this left-hand box, where if they are not understood and not valued, they, of course, they're frustrated, unheard, unsafe, powerless, confused, flat. But when they are in an opportunity to take more ownership, uh, it's a bit like agile ways of working, actually. Actually, uh, They will go into that um, place where they feel more wanted and useful and inspired and connected, etc. It's about ownership, participation and effectiveness. So this is really about looking at communications from the receiving end rather than the delivery end. Um, I hope it's given you some food for thought. Um, and now um, I'd like to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, I want to invite everyone um, to put the questions in the questions box and the questions pane on the right hand side. Um, and until we wait for a few questions, maybe just um, one question. I know that, that um, you mentioned uh, disagreement is OK. Um, and have you ever had a project where um, this was really a big of a problem. So, um, for example, I have a few clients in mind where um, the disagreement was um, quite high. So it was really hard to um, get people on board uh, for the project that we did because there were different silos and different interests. Uh, and and w what would you suggest uh, then, maybe especially from a perspective, if you're an outsider, can you, can you do anything to help? Like I was, for example, as, as a consultant. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because as soon as people understand the reasons why other people hold their views, it becomes they could, they're able to relate to that. So if somebody is unable to accept that, um, they should involve a certain team in in part of a process. Well, if they explain, well, the reason why I think that is this, and the reason why I think there would be a benefit there is this, is because, etc. That will help people to connect to that, even if they don't actually agree with it at the outset. And then again, encouraging people to be comfortable with disagreement. Um, it's okay to have a different point of view. The fact is that you all have to take an action. And you may have to take an action that you don't agree with, but as long as people have been heard and they've had an opportunity to explain, then they will much more likely accept an action that they don't agree with than otherwise. And do you think it helps that um, it's a third party, for example, when you come in, in the um, in the companies um, and, and dealing with those projects as opposed to somebody who's in-house? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because um, if you are external, you don't carry any baggage, of course, and you are able to come in um, purely representing the process and not representing any interest in the relationships with people involved going forwards. So, um, you know, a lot of social alignment can be done with um, people's related teams who come in from outside of the team. But if you're outside of the organization as well, I think it really does help um, mm. to, to do this. Yeah. Okay, um, now we have a few questions. Um, hi, Michael. Michael Nord is asking, how long did the process of Mirror Mirror take? Um, so the interviews take 45 minutes each to, um, to run per person in the team. The development of the report takes about a day. Um, so a, an organize, a team can go through Mirror Mirror from start to finish easily within a week. You can do the interviews in two days, the report, and then the workshop itself is just four hours. So it's a very concise process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from uh, Harold. Harold Jarki, I hope I'm pronouncing this okay. Um, how many people were involved in the quick scan? Uh, we had 14 people in the quick scan. So Mira Mira normally goes up to about 20 people because beyond that, there's probably sub teams actually, they might be informal, but we had 14 people in the quick scan. Um, and that quick scan is where you have 10 questions sent out by e-survey. So it's, it's a much more compressed process. Mm. Okay, thank you. And uh, Quinton Rijus is asking, for what situation is Mirror Mirror applicable? So in situations of change or a merger acquisition or where there's a new team or a virtual team, you'll save a lot of time and money going through Mirror Mirror, which is um, going to have a huge um, return on investment. Like I said, it's very difficult to calculate that investment on a generic basis because every team is different. Um, but those are the sort of situations where Mirror Mirror is really uh, going to add value. Thanks, Quentin. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. I don't think there are any more questions. If anyone wanted to ask another one, um, here's your chance for for a minute or so, uh, while I also remind you that uh, we have a new webinar um, coming up in a month. Um, it's on 18th of June. Um, and uh, everyone who was at the Eurocom, uh, I'm sure you remember it's Ikemiel. Uh, and he will present uh, from elevator to pitch, uh, sorry, from elevator pitch to attention switch, five unexpected, met unexpected methods for becoming an authority in your field. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting and, and passionate, like uh, it's a case. And uh, we do have one more question. Uh, is, it is from uh, Witcher Lepool. Um, is Mirror Mirror customized for every company? Um, Mirror Mirror is designed to um, be um, applicable to any context, but we do have slightly different versions for different settings, for example, executive teams, um, and we have another version for virtual uh, virtual teams. Um, but it's, it's going to be applicable to any context. Um, if you ask the question, what's the biggest opportunity facing your team? that'll apply to any team. So um, yeah, it, it, anybody can use Mirror Mirror. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, um, 
uh, I see your uh, information on the screen, so you have the email um, to contact uh, Lindsay, and we will be sending you the recording tomorrow. Um, I also want to encourage you to uh, opt in when we send you, um, I think the email is going out today, um, an email uh, you probably all know about GDPR and we need your consent to uh, keep sending you information about new webinars and other information from IABC Mina and I'm sure we all have a lot of those in our inboxes right now but I really want to encourage you to um, take a few minutes and, and um, say yes and uh, opt in. Uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for your presentation. My pleasure. Uh, it was lovely to have you and um, goodbye to everyone and we'll see each other in a month on 18th of June. Thank you. Bye. Bye.